Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. So good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for waking up on time to come up and uh, experience the direct action panel. Uh, Robin Hood's direct action panel is uh, the name of the panel, and uh, I was asked to <clears throat> to do a panel. You know, Ian, can you do a, host a panel this year? And what do you want it to be about? And I've kind of got a lot of experience on the civil disobedience panel. The civil disobedience panel has just kind of been a classic panel that we've done here, and I felt, well, that one's kind of over. We've done a lot of civil disobedience and talked a lot about it, and that'll be one of our topics here uh, today on the direct action panel, but I thought that the, the terms direct action kind of opens up the discussion to some more options, like Robin Hooding, for instance. Uh, in some places, it would be civil disobedience, because it's actually illegal in some cities to fill someone else's meter in New Hampshire. That's not the case. So technically, it's not civil disobedience. I think uh, James Cleveland calls it, was it civil obedience? Is that what you call it? So I want to go down the, uh, the list of panelists here and have them give a, a short introduction uh, of themselves in case you are unfamiliar with everybody who's here. So I'll start. I'm Ian Freeman. I host a show called Free Talk Live. We'll actually be broadcasting down here in that little room there uh, tonight from 7 to 10. So feel free to come out and see us. In fact, there's going to be radio, live talk radio, all, all evening long uh, tonight through 1 a.m. So if you like talk radio, then uh, I've got that. And uh, LRN.FM is, is a website, an uh, internet stream that I program that features a number of talk shows, uh, Derek J being one of the hosts on that, uh, that network. And Derek, uh, Derek J. Freeman is a prolific activist. Uh, he spent a lot of time in Keene, New Hampshire, and is planning a comeback uh, for Keene a little bit later on this year. Star of the movie Victimless Crime Spree and Peace News Now. So feel free to uh, say hello. Well, thanks for the lovely introduction, Ian. And uh, that's right, I do a show on LRN twice a week, two hour call in show about peaceful resistance. This is an issue that's very important to me, and I moved to New Hampshire in 2011 for the Free State Project, uh, and I look forward to returning in June. Uh, I'm Graham Colson. Uh, I'm a native to New Hampshire, and I've been involved in activism such as Rob Dean, in Kapoa, and uh, several other projects. Uh, good morning. I'm James Cleveland. I moved to Keene in uh, 2012. You know, I'm kind of like, I mean, I feel like a Superman, like during the day, I'm Clark Kent, I'm, I'm a cost accountant, I'm a pretty boring guy, and then, you know, I, I go into the phone booth and I become Robin Hood Akeen, and, you know, um, it was actually pretty funny. Uh, some of my coworkers, there there was a news station out of Boston that did a report on Robin Hood Akeen, uh, and they, one of them saw the report, and this guy's like a a loudmouth from uh, Massachusetts, so he's telling everyone that I work with, and you know they all love it now. They think it's funny. I mean, they they constantly joke with me about filling the meters, and you know, so it's a good time, and I, I really enjoy doing activism. Hello, my name is Garrett Ian. I'm originally from Concord, New Hampshire. I've lived in Keene uh, almost two years now. And uh, the Robin Hooding project, as it started off, it, it really seemed to, it, it's been an idea that's been around for a long time, but it wasn't until the turn of the year last year that myself and James and a few others uh, tried to ensure that it became a daily activity. And it really seemed to have an impact. I mean, it, it had a, a great impact when it was just something that people would do on their lunch break occasionally. But once it was stepped up, um, the city really entrenched themselves. As many of you know, we were sued by the city of Keene. We ended up winning after months of uh, court proceedings. And fortunately, the city is not letting it rest. They're keeping the attention on Robin Hood and appealing that decision to the Supreme Court. Um, so the other projects I've been involved with in the past have been uh, some police accountability projects like Cop Block and Keene. I've also started Keene Peaceful Streets, which is trying to take things in a little bit different direction, a little bit less adversarial with uh, established organizations. and. Um, yeah, Robin Hooding is something that, as Ian said, it's, it's really flipping the idea of uh, angering them by violating their laws on, on its head. And because we're bringing everyone into compliance, they can't deal with that. They've budgeted for the fact that people are going to break these laws and we're going to profit from that. So um, I like the idea that it's with just a little bit of uh, resources and uh, effort, you can make huge impacts. So, you know, a nickel is, a nickel compared to a $5 ticket is uh, an exponential difference, of course. 
I like that Garrett used the term impact because I think that it that word sums up the purpose of what I would call direct action. So what is direct action? It's kind of a nebulous term. Um, usually the historic definition is to get out into the streets. So getting on Facebook, not really direct action. Um, going to the state house, eh, probably not so direct because you can't really have an impact immediately. Like you, you're doing something when you go to the state house and don't get me wrong, I go, I go you know, on, the, on an average of once a week so far this year. Um, so I'm willing to do whatever it takes to achieve more freedom. But impact, direct impact, being able to affect someone's life in a positive manner, either with uh, enlightenment through information, like handing out cop block uh, warning flyers. If you stop by the free keen table later on, you can grab some of the propaganda that we use for outreach. You know, and, and informing young people, for instance, of their rights, that, that has an impact. Uh, you know, going out, saving people from getting parking tickets, that has a, a real tangible impact. You're, you're keeping money in people's pockets, and that's a huge win for us and uh, a huge loss for the state. So I think that's, that's my definition of, of what uh, d direct action is, something that, where you can literally reach out and touch somebody's life and, and help them in some sort of positive way. And hopefully that will you know, do good things for the image of activism and libertarianism or uh, that, that sort of thing. So, um, but you know, as I mentioned, direct action is, is more than just Robin Hooding. It's more than it, civil disobedience. I think would count uh, also as direct action. So, I guess uh, with that in mind, just kind of going down a list of things. Do you guys feel like I missed something? Like, uh, yeah, I think shire sharing counts as. Yeah, let's let's hear a little bit about that because uh, that's a great point. Yeah. So Ian mentioned um, traditional forms of activism, but I think shire sharing is a seditious form of activism. It's uh, undermining the welfare state, right, by replacing it and uh, showing people how voluntary uh, contributions to your neighbors is actually better than going through a third party that has no financial or otherwise incentive to actually do what they're saying they're doing, uh, giving people help. So Shire Sharing is an organization um, that for a few years now, uh, through the inspiration of uh, Amanda Bolton, one of the Manchester activists, has fed hundreds of families in the Manchester area around Thanksgiving and Christmas time, purely from the donations of uh, people in the community, and also through fundraising through Bitcoin uh, on their website. So people who have never been a part of the geography here have been able to impact the, uh, those in need in New Hampshire. And I think that's a real win. Uh, I'd love to see more direct action looking like that in other places too. Uh, but I think that's, that's one form of direct action that counts as private charity. Okay. Anybody else has one that I've missed? Feel free to touch on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's such a wide umbrella. There's so many things you can do. Like you could um, do the Shire Choir thing, go out and sing, you can hand out literature. I mean, you can hold a sign. There's so many things. Like, to me, the whole point of direct action is it, it starts a conversation. Like, people, if you're out and about in the community, they're going to talk about, you know, what your, your message is, what's going on. And you, you may reach people you don't, you're not even aware at the time. Like, you know, uh, one of the things I've done is uh, don't take the plea deal outreach where you go into... Um, a court and you you hand out information about you know your rights to not take a plea deal and I've had really good conversations with people you know about this and you know a lot of people are not aware that you know they can just say no and you know not take a plea deal and uh, one lady I was talking to she you know she had like a typical story of the state coming after I don't remember the exact thing and she She's like, oh man, I really wish I had gotten this earlier, and you know, and I was talking to her, and she, you know, she decided like pretty much on the spot. She said, well, you know, I've already signed the plea, but I think I'm going to take it to to trial if I can now. And you know, I never followed up. I never heard back from her. But, and I've had a few people. One of the things that we do with Robin Hood is if people do get a ticket, we leave them information about you know how to fight the ticket and some of the benefits to it. And uh, we've had good feedback where one lady in particular, she, I, I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but I think it was like $70 worth of tickets. She fought them 
and instead of paying the state, she did community service. So I thought that was a huge win. And you know, I guess you. My point is, you don't you don't realize the impact that you you're having, but it's more of an impact if you get out in person and do it than Facebook. There's so much information on Facebook, and it's almost I don't want to say it's preaching to the choir because there are a lot of you know, especially in Keene, like we get into it with some of the people who disagree with us, but um, I mean, Facebook is a, like you'll, you'll be arguing with someone on Facebook and then you, you meet them in real life and it's like totally different, you know. It, it's, it's harder to have a, a, a vitriolic conversation in real life. It's harder for them to dislike you in real life. Like um, there is an anti-free Keene protest uh, last, I think it was like September or October. And one of the guys, you know, he was out there uh, just like a loud mouth and, you know, he was like saying all these things. And then later on in Facebook, he, he posted like, oh, they're actually pretty nice. And, you know, <laughs> like we had gone out there and talked to him. So you got anything to add to that? Well, I guess that brings up a good conversation about the what exactly is the reaction, how you can gauge the reaction to different activities. And Robin Hooding has certainly had a major impact um, just in how the, the city has been affected and how they've treated us and decided to dump thousands of dollars down the drain and trying to get us to quit. Um, but also the, the community at large, we get various amounts of differing types of feedback. For the most part, it's positive. If someone's going to come up and say something during the course of Robin Hooding, it's usually like, good job, or here's some change, or I like what you're doing, give me a hug or something. Um, but there, we definitely have some, a, a good handful of haters. And if you notice, when they start critiquing Robin Hood of Keene, it usually starts off with, this is the whole free Keene thing and free state thing, and this is what's wrong with it. Um, so despite the fact that, you know, if one's involved in multiple projects, those projects are going to overshadow uh, one another to some extent. And in Keene, it, it's really as a, I felt come to that with some of the locals. Um, now, unfortunately, it's like the, there's been a lot of anger directed at Robin Hooding, and while I wouldn't say that like you, you're, you should be seeking to make people angry, I know I certainly am not seeking to make anyone angry. Um, it's, it's an effect that, that happens when people see you as being effective, they don't like what you're doing, and if they're powerless to stop it, in which case they were. There was a lot of, well, not a lot of people, but some uh, dedicated haters who were really hoping that we were going to lose the lawsuit and expecting us to lose the lawsuit. And when that didn't happen, I guess a lot of them are unable to process what to do about that. And, um, Afterwards, it was great. I noticed that some people who are, there are some people who are shy about supporting us because of the, the very passionate and forward nature of the people who oppose us, saying that like, if any business were to support us, that they would try and boycott that business. Um, it, it says something about the impact we've had in Keene, and I think the fact that it's a small community really makes a difference. Um, people, people all know each other in Keene, people all talk. So it's, uh, I'd love to see what the same type of project would have an impact in Manchester, where you have a larger city. Um, a larger bureaucracy, and uh, the idea that we've we've made it work on a smaller scale. I'd love to see it scaled and, and see how things change differently. I've got one more point that yeah. I want to add quickly. One thing that wasn't mentioned that I think is particularly effective and cheap and easy to do is ambush interviews that are totally direct, one-on-one, -on -one with either a politician, bureaucrat of some kind. It doesn't have to be to get their vote on something. It could just be asking them about the nature of their job. Or I think that has a serious impact. Anytime people watch a direct interview on YouTube with this ambushed politician, <coughs> it's usually good footage. It has a large impact. You know, it's, I'm glad the critics came up because uh, it was definitely somewhere uh, that I wanted to go. That there are certain kinds of things that we've done, like Robin Hooding, that on its face, and certainly to everybody in this room, likely seems... And I should stop. Who doesn't know what Robin Hooding is? Okay. So Robin Hooding uh, is where you find the parking enforcer on the streets in Keene, uh, and then get in front of that person with nickels or dimes, and you feed expired meters uh, before the parking enforcer can reach the meter to give someone a ticket. So in Keene, we've saved thousands of motorists, and mostly due to the efforts of Graham and Garrett, they're really the, some of the heaviest on the streets. But there are probably about a dozen Robin Hooders who are active to some extent or another, and we literally have every day of the week covered. This has really upset the, the people calling themselves the city of Keene because they're out, uh, you know, like 20, 
thousand dollars or something ridiculous like that. They're they're really hurting quite a bit financially. So you know, you look at something like that, like Robin Hooding, and it seems unassailable. You're doing something really nice for people. You're helping make somebody's day rather than the gov the, you know, the government ruining someone's day. Uh, you you are de you're depriving the city of, of money. You're keeping money in people's pockets. This is a feel good, in my opinion, the most positive successful thing that has been done uh, in the Keene area and maybe even across all of New Hampshire because it's just so well received. Most people do appreciate it. In fact, Robin Hood receives donations, you receive checks, you receive uh, PayPal. I mean, there's people that will send money. Some people will, will bring us rolled nickels. Uh, there's a guy from Vermont who comes all the way over and brings just rolls and rolls of nickels and just gives them to us. So uh, there's clearly a lot of affinity for this idea, but yet there are haters. Yet there are on the other side are this group of a relatively small group of people who some are willing to physically attack you for doing this. Others are threatening you, willing to you know get up in your face and yell at you and call you names. And so it's just amazing that you know it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how unassailable and good something is. Derek, you mentioned Shire Sharing. Shire Sharing, Amanda Bolden and a crew of dozens of free staters put together meals for people every Thanksgiving, you know, at their own cost. And the amount of meals that they've done, I think it's going on three years now, it's like, you know, doubled. They're in the hundreds and hundreds of, of meals that they're doing. You look at that and you think, this is unassailable. You're helping poor people. You're helping people that are in desperate, you know, need of, of sustenance. But no, the critics come out and they, they'll say, oh, well, you're not feeding people 365 days of a year, you free staters. How are you going to get anything done without the government around? So I guess what are some interactions with the critics that you've had? How ridiculous are they? And uh, you know, can anything be done about it? Whoever wants to start. Uh, and, yeah, I'd like to point out, too, I mean, even when it's like one of the you know, we're always taking flag and keen, like, why don't you guys use the system? You know, why don't you use the proper channels to cha try to change the system? And it's like, okay, we're going to do that now. So we, we go to the school board meeting, and then, they, then they're complaining, like, oh, you guys are wasting all of our time, and, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And they, you, you can't win with these people. I mean, they're, you, you could do practically anything. You could be picking up trash, and they'll find something to criticize you. And one thing... You know, uh, uh, the haters, I mean, I never see them doing anything. You know, they had a, one one uh, protest in the square, and that's it. They had two in this one. Okay, they had two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean they're, they're not out there, you know, I'm not, I'm, I think, you know, I'm trying to change the world, make it a better place to live in ways that I want to, and I don't see them doing anything like that you know one one thing I suggested to him was like they're like oh is there anything we can agree on is there anything we can all do you know together and I was like yeah you know I'd like to donate blood let's go do that and, you know and, and no one took me up on it or let's go pick up trash they don't they don't want to do anything they just want to sit back and critique you like you are doing it wrong and I don't want to put any effort into it but I want to tell you how you're doing it wrong and I guess my my point is you cannot win you go to the school board meeting, you, you run for elections, they're going to criticize you. Um, I think Ian, he's been running in keen elections and those kind of things for a long time. And people still, you know, like they'll, I think one person like posted something that you had written on Facebook in a local coffee store. Like, you know, Ian was like, I don't like the state or whatever. That was the message. And Ian's like, you know, thanks for posting it, you know, thanks for sharing my opinion with more people. But I guess you, you can't win with these people. And one of the the classic things I always think about, I don't know if you guys have seen that, that crossing guard in Keene that kind of like basically attacked Derek. I mean, people still talk about that. Like, oh, you guys, uh, you guys bother the crossing guard. <laughs> and there's so many rumors like, um, like I've had people tell me, like, oh, if we stay or stay in front of ambulances, it, you know, what, when did this happen? I asked. Them. <laughs> and it's just like a rumor that they heard, and you know, I think it was like a local that did it once, and you know, he wasn't really a free stater, but 
Oh wow. Well. You know, too bad? Yeah. On, on the topic of critics, Dan Berman stands out. He's the Dave. pastor. Dave Berman. Uh, <laughs> he's the pastor. You know, I haven't been in Key while this has been happening, but I've been following along on YouTube because um, Garrett uh, does a lot of great uploading uh, about this pastor was very upset about the Robin Hooders and what they're doing, uh, especially because they have cameras. It wasn't that they were feeding the meters. It was, I think, his, uh, the part he was offended by was that they film what they're doing. I think this is a great way to stay accountable you know, to your critics, to people who are like, oh, you're being bad. Well, it's like, no, you can watch all the raw footage my whole day. I filmed myself. I'm my own surveillance man. And I, you know, I, if you think I did anything wrong, point it out. Um, so good on you for having so much raw footage to draw from, but this guy hates that. Um, he thinks it's a, you know, invasive to be filming uh, public employees. And he went with his phone and was trying to get all up in everyone's face while they're doing Robin Hooding. It's saying like, oh, do you like this? You know, if, uh, giving them a taste of their own medicine. Well, Garrett took this and turned it around and made his own media, um, producing um, comedy videos of this guy, um, retooling the, the words that he said, and, and making it a, making it win, making it a win by making it entertaining, and just saying like, okay, you've given me a new subject to work with, thank you. So the, the critics can be a positive. Before you leave that subject, may I make a comment? Sure. Last okay. mic's in here. <coughs> Have you thought of? several of you people who this pastor knows going to his service on Sunday, sitting in the front row and attending his service. Yeah, it's been discussed. Okay. Do you, do you mind if I jump in for a minute? I have, I have a little insight. Can you have the mic? Yeah. Good. So I don't know, you guys have interacted with, with Pastor Berman more recently than I have. Um, and, and you may know some things about him that I don't. But when I first moved to, I'm Baron for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'd like to point out that I've been in Keene longer than the rest of these guys have. But anyways, when I first moved to New Hampshire, I went to Pastor Berman's church, and I think you can probably deduce some things about him just from his interactions with you, but I observed them in a totally different light, having been, you know, the, the suggestion here to go to his service. Well, I've been to his church as an attendee, and uh, ultimately decided not to settle there as kind of my home church. So one of the reasons for that is that his political insights came out fairly freely in his his preaching from the pulpit. I've observed that subsequently through many things he, he's written. I don't know if you've read in The Shopper and, and elsewhere. He writes commentary from time to time. So um, you, you have to take a, a little bit of a grain of salt of who are the critics and what is their uh, innate bias and what are they saying about you. I don't know, I don't know if it's the filming per se. I, I really don't think that's it, um, although I suppose it could be. But I think he has an ideology that somehow is threatened. And if you could put your finger on that, uh, I know he's, he's a, a Republican, a staunch Republican, and, and frankly, he's a statist. Um, and I don't mean that as an insult. Um, I, you know, he's, I don't think he's the devil or anything like that. Uh, not my style. But if you can put your finger on that objection that he has, uh, that might provide a, an opportunity to have an actual real conversation. And so going to his church um, may be a good idea, but um, videoing from the front row. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Farron. Uh, so, going back to the, the topic, uh, you know, the critics, further comments? Yeah, one thing I'd like to point out, I think Derek uh, touched on it. You know, I don't feel I'm doing anything wrong. Please come film me. You know, help, help me get out what I'm doing. You know, one of the things that, you know, kind of bothered me about the whole Robin Hooding thing was, you know, you guys did all these terrible things and, you know, okay, well, why didn't you film them? Why didn't the parking officers film them? And the city hired the former police captain, uh, his name is uh, Sturdy, to come out there and video, you know, he was walking around with us filming and he, and, and they, they basically shot, I don't know, like 40 hours of footage and they used none of it. They had nothing. <laughs> and they, they showed one video in court and it was like a 20 minute video and it's just like Graham and Garrett walking around and uh, uh, and at one point there's some chalking on the ground and the parking officer tells Graham 
did you, you know, something like, did you chalk that? It couldn't have been you because you can't spell well. <laughs> so I mean, it's like, really, this is the, this is the one video that you guys are gonna. Well, they, they play another one too, but this is the one video that you're gonna pick to show. I mean, it was ridiculous, the whole thing. And actually, when Rob Liddy first started in 2013, initially the parking officers filmed very briefly. They would film the Rob Hooders, and they quit doing that. And I took that as a sign that, you know, they they came to know us, they became more comfortable with us. We do have a relationship with these people. You know, the parking officers, uh, one in particular, she, she entrusted Garrett enough where she issued an erroneous ticket and she was leaving in her vehicle and Garrett pointed it out to her. She entrusted him to remove the ticket and give it to her, like to go over to the car and get it. So to me that shows that we have a, you know, they, they trust us. And they know, like one of the things that, I think if you watch the video where one of the officers is removing the Robin Hood cards and tearing them up, she, she says, you know, uh, one, one of the parking officers that accused us of removing the tickets, and I told her, you know, I would never do that because to me it does more harm. My goal is to reduce the amount of harm being done by the tickets. If I remove the tickets, the fine goes up. Why, you know, why would I do that? It doesn't make any sense. But I told her, you know, I would never do that. And she said, oh, I know you wouldn't. And so, you know, I, I wish more people would come out and film us. And I don't have a problem with it. You know, I, I want both parties. I wish the parking officers would record all the time. And, you know, I don't, frankly, I don't understand why they don't. One of their job descriptions is something like they're going to conduct uh, visual and audio surveillance for extended periods of time. You know, I don't know what that means, but to me that means filming and audio recording, but anything to add to that? Yeah. I'll play the devil's advocate here. I think what you guys are doing great. I agree 100% you've had a lot more impact than I ever had trying to go through the system, trying to change stuff. Um, but when, and, and surveillance and video, everything that you do is good so that you can show the detractors that you're not doing anything wrong. But what are you going to say to people who support the NSA or support the city putting up these spy cameras or putting them on the traffic lights so that they can give people tickets? What are you going to say to someone that's going to say, well, how is that any different than you um, videoing everything that you do? This brings up a good point. Uh, there's many people that have privacy issues, and if they're out in public, they'll be upset if, if they're being filmed or uh, documented in some way. And uh, I understand that that may have been a concern that people could have held for many years, for you know most of human history, but we're not in that period anymore. We're in a different age, and we're in an age where if you're outside, you can be documented both through audio, through video, and you might not be able to see these devices. Cameras are very small. Audio equipment is very small. Uh, audio equipment and cameras have long ranges. So these are things we have to adapt to in the same way that uh, I think it's easy for people to look at this technology as negative, the fact that someone can be seen from far away. But uh, rather than being Luddites about it, I think we need to empower ourselves. Let's get good zoom lenses. Let's get good audio equipment. And let's be able to document objectively everything we can. Um, sure, people don't like the idea that the government is documenting them, um, but if you have, if someone else has evidence over you, they're free to manipulate it. Let's say the parking enforcers were the only people that ever took video of Robin Hooding. They could, they could have one cheesy little video that really wouldn't show anything, but they can make any claim they want to. Because the power is on our side with all of the documentation that we have, um, we were the ones that brought the facts to the table and the city brought nothing. So. Uh, in the same way with firearms, I think it's, it's not a good thing that the government has guns, but it's a good equalizer that everyone else can too. Um, so I think the same exact thing with any sort of audio or video technology. We're, we're in a post-privacy uh, post age in public. If you're out in public, you have to have the expectation that anything could be documented, whether it's by a friendly or an opposing force. It, yeah, I'd like to, right. I'd like to uh, point out that, I mean, like Garrett was harping on there, I mean, the reality is a, a police officer could, you know, be sitting in his car and watch you run through a red light. Uh, I guess in theory the city could, uh, I'm, I know I've captured people jaywalking on, on video, you know, not intentionally. I guess they could prosecute that, that person, issue them a ticket and do all that stuff. But 
to me, a, a police officer could be out there filming people and, and get the same result. And you know, I video record for three reasons. Number one, you know, I want people to know what I'm doing. I want to get my message out there. You know, number two, if something interesting happens, you know, like I'm out there about accountability. Like if I saw uh, someone beating some, uh, someone else up, I'm going to film it. You know, I don't care who you know who it is. If someone is being the aggressor. You know, I'm going to film it. But and then I guess number three, you know, video videoing is for my protection. It, it's the only tool that I you know I can really use. It's a peaceful method of defending myself from the state. I mean, there have been cases where I've had the police called on me. And ultimately, nothing has happened. And I think part of that is because I'm, you know, I'm running video. You know, if they if they do arrest me, well, I have the video to show my actions and you know pr prepare a case better than if I just have my words. So I think that there is definitely value in that. And uh, I guess my you know it is unfortunate. And I, my I don't like the NSA. I don't like all the surveillance society. But I'm more disturbed by them uh, accessing like a private phone call or reading my emails or things like that. I mean, if like when Peter Thomas was out filming us, I really didn't have a problem with it. You know, I, I post all his videos online, and you know, I'm joking around with him. I'm telling him he needs to cheer up, and I'm like dancing to him at one point, and I'm just having a good time. And you know, I don't really mind if I find in public someone filming me. I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. Can I say something? Sure. I really wanted to address your question directly. What's the difference between the NSA doing it and the Free Staters doing it? The Free Staters are not going to initiate violence against anyone because of their videos. The worst thing that will happen to somebody is they'll see themselves on YouTube, period. Mm -hmm. When the NSA does it, they've got guns, and they're going to aggress against you, and they're going to throw you in cages and possibly kill you. That's the difference, and I think it's really, really important to be clear about this. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, because yeah, well, the yeah, yeah. detractors are going to say, yeah. well, they, you know, the A free huge states difference. will video everybody in public, so why are you against the government right. having cameras up? And I, you know, I've been <laughs> asked that question myself, and mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure, but thank you for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad Paul did that. So clearly, we're already opened up to questions, and I want to I'm going to keep this going. And I appreciate it. I think that's right. We've covered some of the general, you know, what is direct action. Now maybe you guys have questions about direct action and what we do in Keene, because to be honest, Keene's the home for getting out in the streets and, and doing stuff. Um, so I want to just pass this back, and then I'll, I hope you guys can help me with the, the mic passing because we got we got to pass this around. Oh, actually, this gentleman first. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes, you won't hear yourself. Yeah, you just okay. have to speak up so we can hear you. No problem. Um, so just addressing that last thing, um, what I what I like about this particular forum of activism, hearing about Free Talk Live and, uh, and other sources, is that um, it is inherently peaceful. Um, and I would put in the same category the activism of uh, trying to get on the school board stuff. What you're doing is you're basically calling the bluff or uh, exposing kind of the, um, you know, the, the evil part of the whole enterprise. So when you guys go and you, you fill the uh, parking meters, say, well, you know, you guys need, you know, this is to pay for the, the, you know, the streets or, or it just it's, it's a business, right? <laughs> We're paying for the upkeep of the of the parking spaces. So you call the bluff. Oh, hey, we're just filling the meters. You know, we're helping you guys uh, get revenue. But obviously, that's not the way it's set up because uh, it's set up to. It's like a setting them up, set people up for failure. It's it depends on them to uh, violate. You know, they they're a little bit late, and instead of like, oh, well, you owe us that time you didn't pay for, it's like, oh, you got a penalty. You know, you'll know next time not to, uh, you know, you gotta, it's like, I don't know, they demand some sort of, it is, I think it's an instrument of obedience. You know, it's like, you gotta be thinking about us all the time and making sure you don't step one foot outside the line because we will, we will give you a big penalty, you know? So you, that's what's so good about this is it exposes that. Now, the school board thinks it's the same thing. 
I know that you guys aren't like big believers of, of the whole process in the state. On the other hand, you show up, you say, okay, well, let's just see. You, you guys represent the people, um, and you say that the process is so important. Let us show up, use it. What happens? Well, you're wasting our time. Uh, we're still not going to let you, you, even though you might be outvoting us or whatever, uh, that doesn't count. Then suddenly you expose that it's a racket, you know, in many cases, maybe all cases. One question I did have, um, if somebody chose to, let's say, got some of your cards and went to the meters on their own and just, just check the meters and say, oh, this one's almost out of time, putting the money, put the card, hey, you just were saved by the Robin Hooders, is that considered Robin Hooding or is it an essential part that you have to be walking in front of the enforcers? Because that's a, a point of vulnerability. Oh, why are you doing that? Are you trying to intimidate them? You know, and then they go, oh, yeah, they, it is intimidation. In fact, they came so close, I felt threatened for my safety. <laughs> you know, you know that's, if you remove that whole action, that whole aspect of Robin Hooding, would it still be Robin Hooding or not? That's my question. Oh, other people. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get it back on. So, uh, what is Robin Hooding, Grand? What do you think? Well, as a rule, I actually generally don't walk very close to the parking enforcers. Um, I mean, if I see them, I generally will. And I know that Robin Hooding is definitely easier when you walk in front of them because they're going to get a lot less tickets. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel like being accused of harassing anyone. So, I'll generally just walk up and down the streets. Fill any meters that I see are expired or almost expired, put a card on there. And yeah, if I see one of the parking enforcers, we usually walk them for a few minutes, have a friendly conversation, and then we'll be on our way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I probably would generally agree that it is Robin Hood. Like, my, my purpose in being close <laughs> and in front of the enforcer is, to me, it's just the most effective way to do it. Uh, there are various ways that it's done. Like, one gentleman, he, he lets them write a ticket. And then he he hits you know he checks 50 meters around them, and now they can't they can't write a ticket because while they're you know busy doing that, he's hitting all the meters, and then they they have nowhere to go. I mean they're they're going to not have another ticket for 10 minutes. So I, I would say generally speaking, it's Robin Hooding, and um, like my my goal is you know my my time is limited, and I want to. If I am Robin Hooding, I want to be the most effective I can for the least amount of cost. So that's why I go out there, I try to stay 20 feet in front of the enforcers, and uh, I've, I've told them multiple times, and I've offered, like, I, you know, I don't have a problem. I'll stay 50 feet in front of you, but I have to know where you're going. Like, uh, if it's truly about these people feel harassed, why don't they have an established route? Just a, generally speaking, kind of a, a guideline, like we're going to go in a circle. Okay, that's fine. I'll stay in front of you. And my, you know, my goal when I'm out there is to reduce the number of tickets written, not necessarily to be next to the parking enforcer. The reason I have to do that is because they, they will go to, like they'll walk up to an area. They have three ways they can go. I don't know which way they're going to commit to. So I have to, you know, I'm, I'm walking in front of them. I stop and I wait for them. Once they commit to a way, you know, I'll run in front of them and I'll hit, I'll, I'll start feeding the meters again. So to me, it's just a tactic. Uh, some people, uh, it, you know, it is, it can feel, I guess, weird to be next to someone. But like I said, these people now have a working relationship with us. One of the things I did right off the bat was I introduced myself to all the parking enforcers. You know, I'm James. Uh, Cleveland, I'm going to be out here filling the parking meters. I told them what I was doing, you know. And you got anything to add to that? <clears throat> One thing that has been critical for the city is maintaining a certain narrative about Robin Hooding, and that is that the Robin Hooders are harassing, intimidating. Um, so obviously, with the use of video, that nullifies that uh, that idea. But uh, maintaining that narrative has been maintained by uh, some actions of individuals, like we mentioned, the critics. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Dave, the one who came up to us, had some tough questions and put the camera very close to us. He was, I believe, trying to embody the stereotype that was fed to him about what Robin Hooders were doing. So he was behaving in a way that he thought that we would, and he thought we'd respond to. And fortunately, we didn't respond to uh, his, his uh, escalation, I guess you could say. But that being said, I would love it if every day there was a new Dr. Dave out with some tough questions <laughs> on camera. 
<laughs> but uh, unfortunately, many of the people who oppose the activity are just people that are going to shout "fuck you" over their shoulder as they're walking by or something. Um, so I, I I like the uh, I think that the critical the critical nature of like people being critical of Robin Hooding is very healthy. I love hearing their criticisms. And um, but yeah, as as James said, like it, it's most effective if you're within the proximity of the enforcer. If you're not, if you're just out in an area where they're not, um, I think it's a little bit dishonest if you're only putting a short amount of time on a meter and, and claiming to have saved someone. So I'm not putting a card out if the parking enforcer isn't nearby unless I'm giving them at least an hour and a half. All right, let's continue with the questions. But I do want to come back to this topic of being peaceful while you're engaging in direct action. But uh, who is next between? Uh, I, I think this gentleman with the darker shirt. So my question is, why not let the free market uh, deal with the situation? People don't have to park in the parking spots. And they know they have to fill the meters with nickels. They know there's a set time. So it's their responsibility if they, if they don't fill the meters and they get the ticket. Uh, so if that really aggravates the public, why not just let the free market deal with it and they'll quit parking there? When you say that, what do you mean, like, deal with it? Deal with it. Well, if, if it was really a problem and the people of Keene were really aggravated about this parking situation, they wouldn't use the, the, the parking spaces. I'll just, throw, I'll just throw out a quick answer for that one. I think that uh, people are accustomed to government doing certain things, right? So um, when I moved to Keene, it was kind of a shock to the system that I had to hire private trash disposal. I've never had to do that before. I mean, normally, where, where I grew up, the government handled trash disposal. And when you talk, you talk, you can talk to people about this, and there's a bewilderment. The idea that, what? You mean, you can have garbage disposal without the government? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, there are several private companies who provide trash disposal. And if you don't hire someone to take out your trash, it's going to pile up on your, your property, because no one's going to come take it out. And so when you grow up with the state, this idea uh, in your life, you become accustomed to the things that they take care of. And people have become accustomed to the state taking care of parking. That's what they expect. They argue about it. It's an issue. You know, it's, a, it's something that's talked about on the radio. There's a, there's a parking enforcement bureau chief or whatever who makes decisions and has board meetings about well where should the new parking structures be and what should, should we add spaces and this and that and you know they, they it seems like an important thing and so well this is this is the way parking must be done it's downtown Keene we have to have a centralized bureaucracy in charge of this sort of thing there's certainly nothing stopping some entrepreneur from coming in and building a parking garage except for the fact that you know, maybe they'd be competing with an organization that is coercively funded, so it might be difficult to compete. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, real briefly, I would say that number one, the uh, the people of Keene are forced to pay for this system. There's a special property tax that goes to the parking department, and so you're 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 already forced to pay for it. And they have such a monopoly. They've been, I think it's like the night they've had meters since like the 1950s. So, I mean, it is such a, it is like Ian was saying, it's a monopoly and there is no choice. I mean, the reality is if you live in Keene, I mean, there are a lot of businesses downtown and if you want to enjoy them, they're, they're, you can't, unless you're going to park like uh, half a mile away and, you know, they, the cost is low enough where people make that decision, like they do that cost benefit, like, yeah, I'm willing to pay a, a quarter and I'll, I'll park a little bit closer to the restaurant and... If the issue is like that, the, they're smart enough to realize like, okay, we have to keep the ticket low enough where people really won't be upset. Like you know, they're 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 smart enough. If the ticket was two hundred and fifty dollars, you better believe that people would be very angry, and they probably there probably would be a lot more pushback from the citizenry. And so the city is smart enough to realize that you know, let's keep the tickets low, and and someone will go downtown. And it will be annoying to them, like, okay, they get a ticket, and, and it is annoying, right? Like, oh, well, I, I put an hour in, I thought that would be fine, but oh, I got my hair cut, and there was a huge line, and I went and ate, or whatever, and it took longer than I expected. So, you know, I guess to, to answer the question, the, the city won't allow the free market to work. One of the things I proposed to city council was, 
you know, okay, the parking department has lost money for the last three years, the parking fund, and, and your capital improvement program, they, they project out six years, all six years, the parking fund is gonna run a deficit. So how about over three years, you know, you guys come up with some kind of plan, or you know, it could be whatever, to phase out the parking department. And oh, that's a good idea. You know, that's, that's their response. So they, the city won't allow the free market to work. It'd be like, well, why doesn't the free market you know, fix all the potholes? Because it can't. You know, you're, you're still forced to pay for the roads, the gas tax, whether you want to or not. You know, I can't really run a business where you know, I'm ABC patching and I, I go into a neighborhood and I, I guess I suppose I could do it, but people would say, well, you know, I pay the city to do that. You know, wh why, why would I pay you to patch the roads? You know what I mean? Or it's like, why hadn't the free market taken over education? Because there's such an entrenched monopoly. There's so much power behind this that it, it's not allowed, you know, they, they, can't, um, they can't even address it. I hope that answers your question. I, you I just have something real quick. About a free market solution, I see Robin Hood as the free market solution. I mean, people donate. They're funding this. They want to see this as their solution, I would think. One follow-up. Have you guys made an offer to the city? Oh, hang on. Sorry. One more time. <laughs> Have you guys made an offer to the city to buy some parking spaces and maybe some sort of a deal to leave them alone and you can have your own? <laughs> That's cool. Well, there have been some individual projects where we'll pick off uh, a portion of the city and say free parking for the day here and just keep the meters filled. Uh, one of our friends started doing that. And I'm thinking that we're going to be doing more of that this year. Um, but I guess what, when you said about a free market solution, that brings up a good point is, does Robin Hooding have an element of socialism in it? And perhaps it does, because we're providing something for nothing to the people of Keene. Um, but as I said, I think it's an, an example where you're providing very little in your the reward, it's not something we get, it isn't like we get the lost revenue or anyone gets it, it's just something that's not seen by the city and not felt by the people. Uh, yeah, and I would add too, um, that one of my big problems with the parking ticket is, uh, to me it's clearly about the revenue because suppose there's a vehicle and there's six empty spots around it, if they issue a ticket, how, how is that managing parking? That has nothing, okay, the, you know, it didn't fix the problem, and even if all the spots were full and they issued a ticket, the problem still exists, the vehicle's still there. So, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of buying spaces, however, I would add that, so the, the city, they redid one of their parking lots on, uh, I think it's Mechanic Street, I believe, it's behind the fire station. The cost per spot was $5,000 a spot, and I don't know if that's like the market rate or whatever, but to me, I can't afford, I'd love to add 200 spots downtown, but who knows what that cost would be. And, you know, that was one of my proposals to the city was, you know, you guys can eliminate the parking department and build more spaces. That, that you know, to me, it's like a state-run industry. If you flip the switch immediately, like um, in, in the Soviet bloc, you had all these state-run industries. They, they had to kind of have a plan to, you know, like, oh, we've been running these things so long, you can't just make the immediate switch, which is why I, I advocated for a phasing period as opposed to just, like, if they flip the switch immediately, of course, they've been mismanaging parking for 50, 60 years. It's not going to work. They've not, they, they've impeded the free market from fixing the problem. Like, there's, there's no business that says, oh, you know what, I'm not going to build enough parking spots for my business. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't happen in the free market. Could you imagine, like, you went to a, you tried to go shopping, and you can't find a spot, you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to your competitor. So I would say that it's a total problem. It's a total problem of central planning. The downtown has been centrally planned for so long that they, they caused the issue. And they, they do a lot of things where they, they're inefficient in how they, they use the existing space downtown. Like if you look at pictures of Old Keene, the, the pavement, if you will, the roads extend all the way to the shops. Now they, they, they have like the, some of the largest sidewalks I've ever seen, like 10 feet. And they have all this green space downtown. So it's not, they don't want a solution. This is a money-making opportunity for them, even though they, they somehow managed to lose money. <laughs> and, you know, they, that's just the reality. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I had one for okay.
first I would like to suggest that getting something for nothing is private charity, it's not socialism. Uh, but second, have you guys considered pointing out the green aspects of what you're doing, especially to your critics, like well, the papers being saved? Uh, <laughs> that's probably something for Garrett. <laughs> We're saving the planet. <laughs> I'm sure well, uh, that brings to mind one of the things I encourage the parking enforcers not to do is to push the uh, stop traffic button so they can use the crosswalk. And I encourage them that it would be more environmentally friendly that people weren't wasting gas if they just waited for traffic to clear and find an opportunity. Um, yeah, that, it would be nice if they went in a, in a greener direction. I think the, the city of Keene prides itself on being this very progressive uh, small city in this little, in this place surrounded by woods in Cheshire County. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they've moved recently to actually this electronic system on top of the metered system, kind of separate from the metered system, where you can pay for parking in a particular zone by entering uh, ahead of time your credit card and uh, making an account on their website. And when you go to one of those spots, you say, like, I'm in this zone, and they won't write you a ticket. Now, what they're trying to, to advertise that as a way that, oh, if you don't like those Robin Hooders, you can pay electronically, and then they'll also probably fill your meter, and the city will get double money. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is potentially true. I'm, I'm sure we filled meters that were already filled electronically, and we didn't know. However, they're also using that information um, to know when people start parking. They now have an electronic signal telling them they've been parked here two hours. That's a violation, even if they paid. So uh, by using the system, the people who use it are also telling the city, they're sending them a signal, my car's expired, come write me a ticket. <laughs> okay. All right, so back in the back. Um, I know, I've, I'm going to let James handle the bulk of this, but I know donations come in from people who don't live in Keene, because there's a lot of people that shop in Keene, so you know, New Hampshire being a shopping destination in general for people in surrounding states, there's constantly people from Massachusetts and Vermont, Keene being in the southwest, we're the closest city to both of those states, so a lot of times, a lot of people were saving. I've never heard of Robin Hooding before, and uh, they've never you know, experienced anything like this, and that they'll send money. Um, yeah, I would. I don't have a, a breakdown of um, maybe New Hampshireites versus people not in New Hampshire, but there definitely have been significant donations from folks outside of New Hampshire. One of the best things, donation wise, the city of Keene did was file the lawsuit. I mean, we got thousands of dollars when they did that. We had all this publicity. I mean, the donations came flowing in. And, you know, like some of the, the local haters, you know, we're using the little Robin Hood guy, and they, they wrote a letter to Disney, like, they're using your image. Please sue me. Like, I want more publicity, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, um, it's kind of hard to know, too, because uh, there are a lot of Robin Hooders that, like Rapture, you know, he, he gets donations from folks, and then he immediately goes and he, he buys change with it, like he'll get it in person. So I don't, I don't necessarily have an exact dollar figure, but it's in the thousands of dollars of donations we've received. And most of the time, people who pay, I would probably say if we receive checks, it's probably 50-50 it's probably uh, people in New Hampshire versus like Mass, Vermont. Um, as Ian pointed out, Keene is a hub in the area of, of shopping. People come and they, they visit Keene to shop for a variety of reasons. You know, the sales tax, no sales tax is one huge factor. And uh, we, we get a lot of cash in the mail, too. That's probably 50-50 as well. Uh, the, the more online things, like Bitcoins and PayPal, um, I, I probably said that's 25-75. Uh, people, 25% in New Hampshire, it's 75% out. A lot of people will come across articles about Robin Hooding online and then 
they will send a PayPal donation or uh, Bitcoins. And maybe they'll send me a little message like they like what we're doing or whatever. And one one thing that's hard to gauge is the, I mean, Robin Hood, when the lawsuit came out, and even in subsequent months, I mean, it, it was international news. Like there are, like there's a reporter that came down from Denmark and he did a piece. You know, there was a, um, a bunch of newspapers in Spain, a lot of countries, uh, AP did a piece and they just translated it and posted it. You know, all the time I come across like an article like, oh, I don't, you know, I never knew this existed and it's in um, Dutch or whatever, you know, so. Are there any more questions? So, um, there are the haters. And uh, I would say at least most or maybe all of them are the, the public ones, the ones that, that we hear about, uh, are ideologically opposed to freedom or maybe more correctly ideologically supportive of the state in one way or another. And they're kind of committed to that idea and they're very vocal about it. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that can really be done about that. Um, you know, you're stepping on their toes. That's that's what happens, right? There's a separate group of people that I think we don't hear from a whole lot. I hear from them more. Most of my social interactions in Keene are with people who are not free staters. I mean, I see you guys from time to time, but really not a lot. Uh, so, but I have a lot of interactions with neighbors and friends who aren't connected here to the, to the freedom movement. But many of them are very freedom friendly. As you well know, there's a strong native sentiment that favors freedom in New Hampshire. That's ordinary, it's normal, and you don't hear about it. It's not much real high profile. You don't hear about it a lot. In Keene in particular, it's very noisy uh, on the part of the people who, who are pro status. So my question is, um, some of those people, my observation is some of those people uh, have not ideological disputes, but, but stylistic or methodological disputes with uh, Robin Hooding, and in fact, some have, have told me, I feed meters, so like they're pre-Robin Hooders, before any of us ever lived in New Hampshire, they were going around feeding meters, so this is not controversial. These people are uh, happy with feeding meters, and they're very freedom friendly, so they're potentially allies, but they have some other objection, uh, stylistically, and I don't know, sometimes it's the video cameras, sometimes it's who knows what all, but do you have any sense for what can be done um, I mean, I do certain things that, that I think you guys are probably not, largely not, not aware of, but what can be done publicly or in terms of perception and reach out to those people who are ideological allies but turned off for some other reason? We've come up uh, against this objection forever. And uh, I want uh, hopefully everyone on this panel to, to address this question. Um, of the people out there who will say, and to sum up that s sentiment, it's usually said, well, I agree with a lot of what you guys stand for, but I don't agree with your methods. And of course, the question that should be asked, I think, in that case is, well, well what do you mean? What, what is it that you don't agree with? Can you be more specific? And, you know, everybody's got their thing, right? So for everybody, it's something. So it's, well, I don't like it when you record people in public. Or, I don't like it because you uh, follow and, uh, and harass these uh, meter maids. Or, I don't like it because you know, they just come up with something. I don't like uh, smoking pot in public. Or, toplessness, women should not be topless. You know, so, they, these are people who might be with us on 60%, 70%, 50% of the, of the issues. They feel that, uh, that, they, that they understand where we're coming from, maybe on certain things. But then, we're doing things, and inevitably when you do something, they're, it's going to polarize, and that kind of comes back to something we were talking about earlier with Robin Hooding, seemingly to be this like unassailable thing. You're helping people, but yet there's all these people that, you know, and again, a small percentage, I think, but very vocal, who speak against it. What do you say, how do you address this issue of, well, I, I like a lot of what you say, but I don't like your methods. How do you handle that? <clears throat> well, I want to empathize with anyone who's, you know, reaching out to have a discussion about, you know, improving tactics and um, however <coughs> I have to be true to myself and that's ultimately where I'm going to come from when I'm uh, having that discussion and, and showing that empathy it's like I, I hear you that you feel this way and this is why I feel this way and just 
being peaceful and explaining why I do what I do and being true to yourself. I think people can recognize that even if they strongly disagree with what you do, if they see that you're being genuine and that you feel like you're doing a good, right thing, I think that most people can respect that. Yeah, being a local, I hear a lot of these criticisms from people I grew up with, like, oh, you guys have some of the right ideas, not all the right ideas, but some of them, and you just cross too many lines. And I mean, I, I think the lines that are crossed in Keene, and in New Hampshire as a whole, but to be realistic, mostly Keene, um, I, I think those lines that are crossed are completely necessary. I mean, like, this is pushing boundaries that just don't happen elsewhere. Um, and I mean, like, um, well, one thing I heard once while I was Robin Hooding was, uh, oh, you know, I used to be able to bring my kids downtown before you people, but, you know, you guys walk around topless, smoking pot with guns. It's like, that happened three years ago before I lived in Keene. Um, so I don't really know where I was going with that, actually, but, um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say that, you know, um, I, I definitely want to hear people's opinion and, and criticism and critique of anything that or any of us are doing. And uh, if people feel the need to come and talk to me, I try to uh, have a discussion with them. Uh, Dr. Dave in particular, just as an example, I, I sent him an email and I said, you know, I'd like to talk with you on the record and, you know, I'd like to hear your concerns and then uh, you know, maybe I can try to address some of them. And initially he agreed to that, and then he, he backed out later on. He said he's not interested in, you know, in pursuing that, and I was kind of disappointed in that. But a lot of people, they don't, they don't want to actually have a conversation about the methodology that you're using. They just want to say, well, I heard such and such, like my example earlier. I heard you guys stand in front of ambulances, or I heard, you know, you run around naked, or whatever. You know, they, they heard there's a lot of rumors, especially in a small town like Keene. And it's hard to, if, if you live your life trying to please everyone, to me that's a fool's errand. There is no possible way that, that, that you're going to do that. And like I said, if someone has a, a concern, like they really want to talk to me, okay, let's talk. And, if, and if, you're, if your points are that valid and convincing, perhaps I will change my tactics. Like, um, if I'm really doing something that upsets you, let me know about it. There's no way I can change my behavior unless you let me know. So I'm very open to criticism. I want people to offer their perspective and concerns. And, you know, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I try and go the extra mile in, in making people more comfortable who may take issue with the activity. Like when we had protesters in the square, um, we made some cupcakes and brought them down for them. And not that many people were interested, but uh, I think just going, when, when someone's uh, you know, bringing an idea of like, opposition to you, I think you know, meeting, that, uh, meeting their ideas, but then also you know, trying to do some show of reconciliation with them is a great step. Um, one thing I think could be said about, I guess every activist community, it's not specific to New Hampshire, is that uh, when, when somebody involves himself in activity, engages in an activity, it's going to come to consume the identity of that person in other people's minds. So uh, people may see me and associate me with Robin Hooding or James with Robin Hooding or some of the other projects we've been involved with. Um, and for that reason, I think it's good to have a diversity of activities that one's engaged in, and they don't all need to necessarily be political. Um, sometimes when I'm out Robin Hooding, I'll have the shovel, uh, snow shovel in my car, and if I can't find the parking enforcer, I'll shovel out the parking lot so people can walk in between the spaces without having snow up to their knees. Uh, these are just little things that I think really, you know, and it doesn't need to be publicized that much. It's just one of those things like people see the Robin Hooders picking up trash or shoveling snow. Uh, they're going to appreciate that. And I think it's something that's uh, incumbent on all activists to, to go the extra mile and try and be uh, more of what you'd like to see emulated in the community, even if you can't dedicate all of your time to one activity or another. Um, people will, will pick up on those things and perhaps they'll emulate some of those things. I'd like to add real quick, a lot of folks too, they will say like, you know, that what Ian was saying, I, you know, I like what you guys are doing, I don't like your methods. And, and some people will say, well, why don't you do X, Y, Z? Like, why don't you focus on welfare corruption or whatever their pet peeve is? And my general response is, you know, okay, I, I agree that that's an important issue, why don't you do it and show me how to do it? Like it's one thing to, to just tell someone how to do something, but 
it's, it's like learning. You can, I could tell all of you guys, like, okay, um, here's how you do something, and, you know, I'm an Excel guy. Here's how I do it in Excel, but, you know, I should tell you, I should show you, and then, and then you guys do it, and so, you, so I know you learned, right? But, you know, I'm always open to learning. I, I'm, like, like Pete Ayer says, uh, in court, they, they ask him, like, what's your highest level of education? And I don't remember how old he is, but he said, like, oh, uh, 35 years. You know, I, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, just hold the question for just a moment, because I, I, we've kind of come on to a, to a topic that I think is really important. I just want to th throw this out there um, about being peaceful. I wanted to come back around to this, you know, because the critics and the quiet, the quiet critics, uh, you know, saying, well, I, I like a lot of what you say, but I don't like your tactics. Well, first of all, okay, what do you mean by that? Does that mean I'm only supposed to do politics? Because people don't like that either. You know, as we found out with the school board meeting, we brought a dozen people in there, proposed uh, lower budgets, and, you know, we were voted down, obviously, but there, we were spoken against, we were laughed at, we were told by the, the people in this, uh, this room, especially one attorney who's like, you know, Mr. Parliamentarian who gets up there and basically plays for the state. Uh, this attorney essentially called us, you know, these people and really just very looking down one's nose at us. Um, there's not much you can do to satisfy everybody. And I think that point was, was made very, very well. So even if all you do is politics, as soon as you become successful there, the hate, people will hate you for that. Uh, so anytime you do something that makes an impact, and, and usually politics, you don't make an impact immediately. So you won't get that initial, you know, it won't be like going out topless on the square where there's going to be an initial reaction to, to that from people in the community. When you're in the political scene, you're writing letters to politicians, you're speaking at, uh, you know, city council hearings, you're speaking at, at the state house. It doesn't have a, a real, it doesn't make a splash. People aren't going to be as opinionated because they're never going to hear about it for the most part. But when you do something that people hear about, it makes the news. That's when people have opinions, and when you're upsetting their, their viewpoint of the world, they're more likely to bristle against it. Uh, if it's something that challenges their long-held beliefs, they're likely to bristle against it. So we, we really can't make people happy. But I think one of the most important things we can do consistently, I agree, James, we should listen to critique. I've yep. seen, I've seen uh, you know, keen activism change over the years. I've been there for a long time. And I've seen it uh, shift. I think like the school outreach, for instance, there was a real pushback against that from some people in the community. And so we changed our tactics. Rather than talking about school sucks, let's talk about how great education is, but maybe government school, not so great. So kind of change the perspective. Be more effective with what it is that you're doing. The other thing that you can do consistently, regardless of what other people think and say, is you can remain peaceful, especially in the face of people who are threatening to you, especially in the face of people who are critical, getting up in your face. There have been a lot of situations uh, that people have been involved in, and I think everyone at this table has, has experienced this, because we're all out on the streets, we're all doing things. A lot of situations where people have threatened us or you know, attempted to escalate a situation, and we've successfully de-escalated those situations. So I'd like, uh, and D Derek, I'm gonna think of one here, but if you wanna add an additional one that you can recall on how you handle that, how you stay calm. Um, one of them was this camera. Uh, you had a camera taken from you by a man on the street who, ironically enough, turns out to be a professional videographer, the man who stole Derek J's camera. He works with Ken Burns, apparently, this you know, documentary filmmaker. And uh, you were just out doing a report on Robin Hooding at the time, and this guy gets out of his minivan, he comes up, he takes your camera from you. Now, you read the comments on YouTube about this, which I don't generally recommend, but you'll see people <laughs> saying things like, Man, Derek, if I were you, I'd have shot that guy. And how would that have made things go? <laughs> when, how did you handle that? Yeah, uh, instead, I froze. I was pretty su surprised. I'm not accustomed to people just taking things out of my hands. And uh, he was accusing me of being a Robin Hooder, which I wasn't. I was filming the Robin Hooders. You know, I'd only been in town for like a day I was visiting, so it was really strange. And I froze and just stared and let him yell at me while he was holding my camera. So this is great because, you know, I'm filming him at first, he comes up, grabs it, but now, I guess with his videographer instincts, which I wasn't aware of, he's filming me and I'm standing there like, you know, doe-eyed. And uh, 
instead the the driver who was at the car who was uh, being had the meter fed um, he comes out and he's like well wait 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 what's that's my car it's okay you know that's that's all right whatever was happening it's fine you know it's just like trying to de-escalate this third person who didn't really see what was going on didn't really know that the camera had been stolen or anything was just like he saw something was wrong um, because there was one guy yelling, <laughs> me just very confused. And uh, I, I think if you'll watch the video, it happens pretty quickly, but he ends up being like, all right, I became the aggressor here. He doesn't say those words, but then he turns around and gives the camera back after having like threatened me and um, apologizes and, and goes on his way. And I thought that was a huge, huge win. Um, because it could have easily escalated. I know a lot of people's first reaction, especially in, in the comment section of YouTube, was like, why don't you pop that guy? You know, like, I, like I can pop anyone. <laughs> and I'm like, but that was what a lot of people's reaction, I think, would be. And I think it's a good general rule to keep the five second rule of like, before you speak or before you act in, in a really strong way, maybe take a breath and think about what you're going to do for five seconds. No one's going to blame you for just like taking a breath and thinking for a little while. And on camera, it actually worked out pretty nice. <laughs> so that's, that's one situation. You've had, you've had a run in. Yeah, yeah I can say that. Uh, I've actually I've had several situations like that. I mean, like was talked about earlier, the uh, Dr. Dave Berman incident. And that was more humorous than anything. For anyone that's seen the video, me and Gary obviously handled the situation pretty peacefully. Um, and then recently, there was a guy contracted through the city of Keene working for uh, Emerson's Towing and Repairs. And so I'm standing about 30 feet away as he shows up to tow. And I, I don't even know why I was filming, honestly. I usually don't film, which I should, but I, I decided that day I'm going to film this car being towed. Yeah, that's and a good thing to film. Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, and the dude gets out of his vehicle, and the first thing he says is, get that camera out of my face or I'll knock your teeth out. And this is from about 30 feet away. So, you know, obviously, someone's telling me they're going to knock my teeth out, chances are I'm going to keep filming. Situation only got uglier from there, but I, I handled it relatively peacefully. I mean, I, I personally think I could have handled it better, honestly. I've been told by a lot of people, like, oh, you handled it fine. Like, you know, the guy was screaming at you. He told you he'd knock your teeth out. He told you next time he'd have to... He told me in front of a cop, because the cops eventually got called by someone else. Um, he told me, uh, I don't have a gun, next time I will. Yeah, I, I could have handled it better, but realistically, yes, I handled it peacefully because that's really the only way you can handle situations like that without escalating it to violence, and I, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, you know, this is something that um, I, I've struggled with. Um, you know, on one hand, I, I want to defend myself, but like a, a guy um, named Nick, there's a video where he... He, he, he punches me, he takes a swing at me, and, you know, I made a very conscious decision, like, you know, if this guy's going to hit me, you know, go ahead, and, and I made the decision, like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything, perhaps if he, and, and I didn't file charges, and perhaps I should have, but one of the things, like, if he had injured me or my property, I probably would have been more upset, you know, I, I forgive the guy, I mean, he, he was upset, and he punched me, and, and it is very hard to remain peaceful. It's hard when someone is is really angry at you and, and yelling. And I, I think that it like what really motivates me. You know, I've changed a lot over the years. A couple of years ago, I would have decked the guy. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. And I think being around people who are peaceful has definitely shifted my perspective to you know, peace is the way, and that's how I want to live my life. I don't want uh, you know, I don't want to get violent unless it's absolutely necessary. And, uh, you know, perhaps if, you know, someone was trying to kill me, I probably would defend myself. But, I mean, like if someone is just, is just talking to you, even if it's in a very angry tone and cussing you out and they're very upset with you, I mean, the reality is that's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt you if they're filming you. It's not, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're going to be fine. And I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, until it actually gets physical, and even then, if you can, it's better to, I would argue, to run away, to keep the moral high ground, than to initiate force, even, even self-defensive force, because the moment you do that, people are going to be like, well, I thought you were peaceful. 
And if the message you want to present to the world is, I'm a peaceful guy, and that's the message that I want, you know, I want to live in a peaceful world, it's like Gandhi said, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. And, and if someone is going to, like let's say someone came up and, and shot me or something, you know, they're so upset with me that they're going to do that. I mean, uh, I guess that's just the, the, you know, my, my fate, if you will. Obviously, like when I cross the street, I'm going to look both ways. I don't want to go down, but I, I'm not going to live my life in fear of what other people are going to do to me. And to me, that's like they're winning. If, if someone is threatening you, they're bullying you, and they're saying, I'm going to use force against you, which, you know, like the state, and you say, oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll give in. At the end of the day, it's like you're, you're giving them what they want. And I, I don't want to do that. I want to say, you know, no, what you're doing is wrong, and, well, I'm not going to necessarily take a, some kind of violent action to stop you. I'm definitely going to try to point that out. I think it's great that, that Graham filmed the interaction with the tow driver. And if the, even if the gentleman, let's say he'd gotten out of the car, I had been there, and he said, hey, I don't want you to film me, I would have told him my reason. Like, well, you're, you're working for the city right now. You're about to take this person's car, and, well, I don't want to film you. I want to, I want to film that. I want to show people the consequences of what happens if you get a ticket and you don't pay for it. So, you know, I, I probably would try to, like, de-escalate, explain my motivation. I, I think that goes a long way. Some people you can't reason with. There's, Gary and I have been attacked, like, outside of McHugh's. They're, they're drunk or whatever, you know, and the guy, like, latched on to Garrett. And at that point, I did intervene, and I, like, pushed him away. But, I mean, some people you, you can't really reason with. And I don't know, I guess my, my point is... I don't want to say no matter what, but pretty much no matter what, you have to remain peaceful. The second you, you, you lose legitimacy if you, if you fly off the hinges. And one of the things that, like um, in the Civil Rights Movement, there, there's some great like, training documents you can read where, uh, like they, they have these training sessions for people doing sit-ins or whatever other actions they were doing where potentially people would attack them, whether <laughs> individuals or uh, people working for the state, and there there are some really great things to read, and people would be like screaming at. They they would train for these kind of things, and they they they're pretty smart too. They would like dress up, and they would try to maybe they're even smarter than us in that regard. But uh, they would try to maintain that public image. That's so important. You want to add anything? Yeah, sure. This is one of those situations where the more experience you have with it, like police encounters, the more police encounters you have, you'll become less nervous, more comfortable, uh, more aware of what you need to do next time. And I'd say the same is true when somebody is trying to pick a fight with you and somebody wants to engage in violence. Um, the more experience you have with that, and unfortunately I've got a lot of experience with that, um, the, I'd say the more calm you get and the more reasonable you can be. Um, it's hard not to get angry when somebody's angry with you and wanting to attack you, but as when you, I, I guess uh, I bring to the table a certain confidence that I know I can evade just about anyone on foot. And <laughs> I, um, I also know that uh, coming from like a criminal justice or police accountability background, the criminal justice system as many of us know as libertarians and anarchists doesn't really provide justice. At the very best, the most it can do is just remove violent people from society. That's really the only thing that it could practically accomplish. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you can do with a camera and documenting someone's bad activity, I think goes above and beyond anything that can be done if nobody documents it and you just tell the story of what this person did that was so bad. So uh, the camera is a wonderful criminal justice tool. I feel like any time when Robin Hooding has gotten to a point, or when I've been out Robin Hooding, and someone has tried to engage me with either threats or actual acts of violence, that, uh, of course, it detracts from the activism. It, Robin Hooding stops at that point, and it becomes about ensuring my safety, ensuring the safety of others, and keeping the camera and the lens focused on them, even if that angers them. And if it does, they need to learn that if the more angry they get, the more lenses are going to be pointed at them. Fortunately, in the situation with uh, that Nick guy that punched James, there was uh, three of us who had cameras, and we were tri we were triangulating around him. And the reason we began filming is because he began making threats. So uh, I see that that that's not, of course, Robin Hooding. That's a, a public safety activism. 
But um, of course, that's anything that any of us could do. If you see someone engaging in threats of violence or acts of violence, document it 100%. Um, that's the, the best thing you can do and expose their behavior. And that will anger them. Um, I got video of a rather large man named Travis Hobbs trying to attack myself. When he failed to attack myself, he then turned his rage on Graham. Um, now, I, I had some serious contemplating to do as to whether or not to file criminal charges against this person. And uh, the straw that broke the camel's back in deciding to put my principles aside and let the state go after uh, one of their biggest supporters was that uh, he continued to make threats of violence. Um, free speech is great. Uh, Robin Hooding, I guess, is a free speech activity. I didn't realize that until we got sued and won on free speech grounds, I guess. <laughs> but uh, many of these, I mean, I guess maybe, not to stereotype, but there's like a little bit of a backwoods element in Keene because it is kind of isolated. And I get the impression that some of these, uh, I'll use a derogatory term like rednecks, um, some of these people believe that, oh, well, I can threaten you, that's free speech. In fact, the man who threatened Graham said, it's, this isn't criminal threatening, that's when I threaten to kill you, not kick your ass. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing that's been, uh, I found a little bit disappointing about Keen is that when the video like such with Graham, uh, when somebody's making such extreme threats, I mean the city officials, they know the PR stuff, the, the city manager, he backed away from that, and he said that uh, that tow company is off the city's towing list for a while. Uh, but like the community itself, I thought it was a, a rather uh, poor and shameful reaction on some of the parts of the haters to be defending this man's actions, defending threats of violence. Um, so I think that's something that obviously I, I wouldn't say capitalize on, but um, you need to, that needs to be documented. People need to. Uh, it's a conversation that we need to continue to have. It's unfortunate that Robin Hooding has come to kind of intersect with criminal justice activism at all, but. Um, when it goes in that direction, I think that's when uh, it's, all, it's an accountability project, but if anything needs more accountability than the parking structure, it's the criminal justice system. So uh, more videography in court or of those proceedings would be great. I don't think it's necessarily an indictment of Keene as a location that people would, would be in support of someone you know, committing violence against a Robin Hooder. I think that if this were happening to the extent that it is in Keene anywhere else, you would see a violent pushback. You would see people supporting that violence. I mean, people, uh, you know, they went to watch executions, you know, back in the day. So there's certainly a, a, a contingent of people out there who have a certain bloodlust, and they uh, love the idea that we might get hurt and that we might, you know, possibly get killed, etc. I know there were at least a couple questions over here. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Who uh, would like to? Okay. <laughs> So, talking about cameras and public cameras versus private cameras, uh, I have, well, a couple things. Uh, in New Mexico, they used to have some red light cameras, and uh, we heard from one of the people high up in the police department that uh, the public reason was for public safety, because less people run red lights, we have uh, more safety. But what was actually happening was it was a revenue generator, and uh, it created more accidents as, as uh, people would approach an intersection, they'd slam on their brakes and you'd end up with a lot of accidents, but they were generating revenue and eventually they were removed. Uh, but those public cameras, already in our town in Albuquerque, there's uh, cameras on every uh, stoplight aimed at the intersections. And I had a, a, a small car accident and the lady gave me some false info. I eventually figured it all out and had my first court experience working through that. So it was a good, I, I saw it as an opportunity to work through the court system. But I was thinking about those public cameras and what if I couldn't have figured out who she was and where she was? Could I have gotten a copy of the, the video footage from the city? I mean, it's publicly funded. And I know in like universities, when you uh, publicly fund a research project, that the results of that become public and people can use it. So if we're publicly funding all of these cameras that the, the state uses, I, I think the, the data should be public. I'm just going to throw a quick answer out for that one. Uh, in New Hampshire, we have the 91A process, and there's a group of activists in Keene that have been meeting over the last uh, few years, not a few years, a few months, 
uh, to uh, to talk about 91A and for and create 91A requests. So you send this uh, sheet into whatever government agency that you want information from, like video footage, for instance, and they're supposed to respond with that. There are certain excuses they can use in certain circumstances to tell you they are not going to give you the information, but something like that. Uh, as James mentioned, with the Robin Hooding situation, they had that cop come out and film 40 hours worth of footage. We have all that footage, and that footage was uploaded to the, was it Freeman TV Raw? The Freeman TV Raw channel on YouTube. So yeah, in New Hampshire, most of that stuff is, uh, is absolutely available. Questions that, uh, from folks who have not asked them. I don't actually have a question. I just really want to thank you guys, because I think what you're doing is really important. I think I've learned so much since before I moved to New Hampshire, and since I moved to New Hampshire, from you and from the videos that you post and understand so much more about why you're doing what you're doing. And um, even the Robin Hood thing, I know that you, it's, I think that um, <coughs> I've been able to really see how, I'm um, sorry everybody, I'm gonna swear, how fucked up it is that they would spend so much money and so many resources to sue you, sue you again, sue you again, try and send a PI up, like to follow you guys around and, and harass you. I've watched the, all, most of the videos that you've talked about today, I've seen. I, I thought you handled it really well with the towing jerk. And um, you know, I know that you said something when you posted it about how you shouldn't have said one of the things you said, but quite I frankly... Him, I called him a fucking loser at the end. And but he was. <laughs> he got out of the car. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't pause, he got out and aggressed upon you. And you, did, you handled that spectacularly. I've, I have immense respect for you guys, and I just want to thank you. Any comments, or should we go to the next question? Um, probably the next question. Okay. Uh, Dustin? So you're taking actions, and you're getting responses. Can you sit back and quantify, based on all the, the peaceful approaches you've taken to turn it around to use it to change the community and work in this project can you sit back and quantify what's most powerful what's most effective and you barely touched on the court process here and in my world looking at you from three thousand miles away that's incredibly huge um, but is is the public responses the write-ups what is working what is making a big change who wants to jump on that first? Uh, that's one of the things that I love about Robin Hooding. I mean, we've probably gone through, we're, we're approaching having gone through 10,000 Robin Hood cards. So, I mean, you could conservatively <laughs> <laughs> say we, we saved, you know, let's just guess, 8,000 people from parking tickets. So, I mean, to me, that's a huge quantifiable result. Um, a lot of the things too happen, and then they don't—they don't really make the news. Like uh, one particular case, there is a young um, female. She, the the police had had come to a, a local convenience store, and she was kind of out back, and they were saying like, "Oh, we got reports that kids were drinking out here," and you know, and she was on like I guess probation or something. They they obviously knew who she was. And they're like, oh, we need to look in your bag. And, I was, and I, I was like, you don't have to let them look in your bag. And she's like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, she was about to let them do that. So there's all kinds of things that happen where it, it's rare, too. Like, you may not even see the impact of something. Like, I, I was at a social gathering uh, one evening on a Saturday night, just like a, a you know, a cook cookout among friends. And there were non free staters there. And at one point, this guy, and, you know, I'm an accountant, he, he was an accountant, so we were really getting, like, getting into it and having a good old time, but uh, <laughs> he, he mentioned, like, oh, something interesting happened to me today. I was downtown, and uh, th these people paid my meter, and they left a card. And I was like, oh, tell me about that. What do you think? I was like, oh, this is awesome. I used to get so many tickets, and, you know, in Keene, and this is, like, the best thing ever. And then I was like... I was like, oh yeah, I was out earlier today, and it was probably me. Like I told him that. So it was like a, he was like, oh yeah, you know, you're the man. And it's not often that you get to see 
the results and sometimes you you may like like it's interesting like coming to an event like this I have a lot of people come up to me and they're like you know I've seen a lot of YouTube videos and like like this lady here and you know it had an impact on their life it, it, you don't even know the the amount of impact that you're having and so it, it's hard to quantify I guess is my answer The, the whole thing about court, I mean, it, it was like a great blessing from the state that they sued us. It got us all this press attention. They didn't have a case to begin with. <laughs> I mean, you really couldn't have asked for a, a better situation as far as the state's uh, poor response. Um, and I think it, it, may be, it shows that they're, they're getting into new ground. Most of us here have faced some level of criminal charges for our activism in the past. And the fact that they're, they, I wouldn't say they stopped using criminal charges against us, but um, the fact that they were trying out this new territory, this civil court, this like friendlier court uh, with us, which I know far less about, which seems far more complicated than criminal court. Um, it's new ground. Fortunately, we had an attorney that stepped up to the plate for us, John Meyer, and he does a whole lot for a lot of good people um, providing free legal services. Um, so. In addition to like us up here, there are people behind the scenes that are that are really uh, helping make things work. I think we still probably would have won the case without him, but perhaps they would have slipped us up in a bunch of the legal stuff that we had no idea how that works. So, I don't know. It's hard to know where stuff lands in terms of quantifying. It's something I'm always asking myself. And one way that I can measure that is YouTube views. You know, that's one avenue that you can at least measure. That's it's kept track of. And um, that's a couple of the videos, or a handful probably, from Keen have gotten well over a million views, which is, you know, that's a, that's a huge win any time. Um, Victimless Crime Spree uh, is approaching 150K, and that's, that's a win. You know, people, at the, the comment sections of these um, videos are especially high, and I think those are ways that we can also quantify the impact that you're having, you know, because it's, it's not just local, it's not just dollars. Like, you know, you mentioned uh, one way to quantify Robinhood is that the donations are coming in. You can see dollar signs. Um, but with YouTube, I've, I, you know, with all the other avenues, like with LRN, it can be tough. How many people are listening? You know, at any given time, you don't really know. Uh, but, yeah, right. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add really quickly. Um, Speaking of Derek J's victims crime spree, so a lot of the reason I'm in Keene is because of that movie. And there, there are other great uh, folks. Um, like I met a gentleman in 2011 at Pork Fest, and he, you know, um, we were kind of talking, and and then I met him again in 2012. Uh, Stephen is his name. H him and Daryl were kind of like, and and I watched uh, Derek J's victimless crime spree. That was kind of what pushed me over the edge. Like I just made the move. I mean. I had like no plans and you know, I was just like, okay. Uh, like I went to Keene for a week, I applied for a bunch of jobs, I threw everything in my, you know, I, I started driving back, I got three interviews lined up, I threw everything in the car and just moved in like two days, so I probably would not recommend doing that, but <laughs> I still got a lot of stuff at home and you know. But. By the way, we're over time, but nothing happens in here until 11, so we're, I'll just keep going. We'll keep going as long as you guys are cool with staying, right? Uh, yeah. As long as you all have questions, we're, we're going to keep this going. But just to ask, uh, answer your question, Dustin, you know, you mentioned the radio, uh, LRN.FM is what I program. It's a radio network, and uh, Derek, Derek and I both have shows on uh, that network. The intention of LRN.FM is to... Uh, uh, to provide a signal for people that want to run a radio station. That's actually one of the main purposes that I created the, the, the network for. Yes, it's a nice place to go to listen online to liberty-oriented talk, so there's, there's dual purpose. There's one, to give people good talk radio content to listen to, hopefully both people in the movement who want to hear new shows that they've never heard of before, and people who don't know anything about liberty, which of course the broadcast radio world is a good way to bring people to these ideas who otherwise wouldn't find them. Because if you want to find my show or Derek's show online, you have to seek it. You have to look for libertarian podcasts. So it's easy for us to get the seekers. But to find those who don't know about us and don't know about liberty, that's where broadcast radio, I think, is very, very useful. In Keene, we've had a couple of uh, pirate radio stations, uh, community stations, whatever you'd like to call them. There's one in operation right now, as a matter of fact. It's technically, technically, that's our third station. 
Uh, the first two lasted about eight or nine months before the FCC came sniffing around and the operators of those stations decided at, at the first threat they received that they were going to shut down. So eventually it would be nice to see what happens when, when an operator continues operating uh, in, uh, you know, even under that, uh, that FCC threat. Uh, but it was interesting when one of the stations sh shut down, we actually heard, it's interesting who you hear from, yeah, that's funny. Uh, Fred Parcells, for those of you who have been following the Free Keen blog, this is one of the code enforcers in town, Fred Parcells made a comment recently about how he can't get the signal in Southeast Keene and he wants to listen to Free Talk Live in the morning when he's driving around doing his code enforcing. Judge Burke uh, told Mark Edge when one of the stations went off a couple years ago, Judge Burke, who, you know, everybody knows if you've watched the videos in Keene, he's the judge in district court. He was in uh, the YMCA working out, as he tends to do, and Mark was working out the Y at the same time. And you know, Burke knows who Mark is, and Burke made a comment to Mark about missing listening to our radio station, and he wondered when it was going to come back on the air. So, you know, not only do you not know whose lives you're touching as far as uh, just, you know, the regular folks out there, it's an amazing you know, number of the bureaucrats themselves and the government agents who are who are listening and paying attention. And that can't be uh, a bad thing. So do we have any other questions at this moment? All the way in the back. Yeah. You might want to mention the jail guards also uh, watch. The jail guards, I mean, all kinds of people watch what we're doing. No, I, I'd like to address uh, the question that was has been on the floor for a while, is people come up and say, well, I really like what you're doing, but your methods are wrong, okay? And I think there, there, there can be a really good way of, of, of handling that, you know. Uh, first of all, they're giving you agreement. So my, my idea is to sell it to them. What is it, about it our, 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 what is it about our goals that you really like? Okay, because they've said, well, I, I like your ideas, or I, li I like what you're trying to do, okay? What is it about, and really sell it to them. You know, find out how much agreement there is and really cement that. And then say, okay, what methods would you use to accomplish this goal? Where are they going to go? They might come up with something creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, that, that was all. That, I just wanted to bring that up because I haven't heard anybody say that. Any comments on that? <coughs> yeah, and I'd say one thing, you know, some of the methods we use, you know, like if, if we're going out chalking, I mean, that's just like a a cheap, easy way to get your message out, whatever it is, right? Like, people will, will look at it and they'll read it, and, and, you know, they'll think about it, whatever you're talking. And it's um, it's because we don't, you know, necessarily we don't have a platform to reach uh, a huge number of people. Like, like, if you chalk something, like, let's say, in front of the courthouse or whatever, like, don't take the plea or whatever, um, you, you're reaching people and it's like a lower cost way of like holding a sign or whatever. Um, and it's because we, some cases you don't have a platform. We obviously have a lot of tools we can use. Like there's a local access television show called Cheshire TV. A lot of activists in Keene produce shows and they put them on there. Um, there's some great, there's a, a, a guy that just moved to Keene last year. He's been writing, there's a couple people that write letters to the editor, which I think is huge because there's a lot of people, frankly, that they won't go online, they won't watch television, and the newspaper is still their, their medium of getting information. I, I really appreciate the people that, that do those kind of things. And I, I mean, it, it is very difficult to, to reach everyone, and you know, it's just like you gotta keep, keep going, and like Garrett's real big into chalking, and I love it, and you know. Do, do we have any more questions? I'd actually get a brief comment on that. Um, yeah, I should clarify, a lot of the people that say, like, oh, I agree with like 80 or 90% of what you guys do, it really comes down to, well, I, I like the Second Amendment, and I think we should get back to a constitutional republic, but other than that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, um, to the gentleman's point, uh, you, you, I like your, your ideology, but not your methods. Um, and then they, they suggest a method that's well, they've been doing that for 200 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't see any impact. I'm, I'm not gonna. Uh, I can, I can read history. You know, I'm not gonna spin my wheels and and do something that I know is not gonna have a result. That was my point. It, yeah, and I think, I think it was a great point to bring up. I mean, the, you know, let's just take, 
Um, if you look at like abolition or the civil rights movement, I mean, there were abolitionists at the, the founding, you know, in the 1700s of America. And, the, you know, the issue, it didn't get any traction for so long. And so, like, to me, the, the tried and true methods of, like, okay, writing newspaper articles, writing books, talking to people, that stuff takes a long time. And, you know, I want to do, I want to spend my resources on things that, that are quicker. And, you know, I, I think it's great that people write books and, like I said, newspaper articles, but <coughs> I, don't, I don't see the results from a lot of those activities where I know if I go out robbing it, you know, it's immediate results. I, I see it right there. And it, it's more satisfying to me. I, I know I'm making a difference. I know I saved 60 people today. It, you know, it, like it feels good, but are there any other questions? I, I want to make a comment about um, Paul's point. Uh, a lot of the activism methods that people disagree with happen to be things that happen on the spur of the moment that you weren't really planning for. Um, and it's, those instances also tend to be some of my favorite, they're the most impactful. One that comes to mind is James uh, sitting on his chalking in front of the courthouse. Um, he had drew, drawn a picture of Robin Hood. The city agents decided to wipe it away with a hose and he decided to sit on his um, drawings to preserve it. So the, you know, they're not going to oppose me, right? But they did. <laughs> and uh, people would say, well, what, you know, why would you do that? Or why would you, you know, you're, you're making a scene or I don't agree with that method, right? But it's not like he says, oh, I, I go out every day and I sit on chalking. You know, it, was, it comes from a place of like, I have to do something in this moment. And it has, you know, I don't know what, you know, I'm going to do something right now. And it's not always planned, but I think a lot of the criticism comes from instances like that, and not so much like the daily Robin Hooding. And I think a lot of people's uncomfortability, I'll continue in a moment, I think a lot of people's uncomfortability from a situation like that is that it's, it forces them to address it, right? Because they don't want to see, you don't want to see somebody get hosed down. Uh, you don't want to see uh, a situation like that. And, and it, it forces people to, to look at that and come up with an opinion about it. And, you know, they would rather not. You know, they would rather not have been challenged with that video. They would rather not have been challenged with knowing that their, their government agents, the ones that they, you know, have been told, we're the government and you elected us and, you know, all these uh, cliched sort of excuses, they don't want to believe that their neighbors, in a lot of cases, these are people they might know as well. You know, talk about Keene being a small town. When some bureaucrat misbehaves, a lot of the people who feel uncomfortable about that probably know who that person is. They might go to church with him or her. They might have some sort of a, you know, a social group interaction with that person. They may be their friends uh, in, for whatever reason. These people know one another. And so to see someone they know behaving like, oh, well, George, the janitor, sprayed down that, that boy with a, a hose? Well, he must have done something to deserve that. My friend wouldn't do anything bad like that. So who knows what internal conversations people are having and that they're, they're forced to have by this direct action. And in a lot of cases, we're talking about you know, non-cooperation, basically. It wasn't civil disobedience. You just were, were kind of obstructing what they were, were trying to do. Um, so let's, let's go on here. We started the panel discussion on ticketing, and sometimes we do get tickets. Right now, I have a case on appeal before the New Hampshire Supreme Court. I, I committed the victimless crime of forgetting to have my vehicle inspected. Uh, what you want to do is you don't even want to take this to court. You want to stop it at the court. In order for a case, for a judge to uh, hear a case, the judge has to have jurisdiction. And yes, I lived in a town, I lived in the state of New Hampshire, but my question to the prosecutor during discovery was, what evidence do you have that the Constitution and the codes are applicable to me? If there is no evidence, there's no jurisdiction. There will not be a court case. The prosecutor said to me on discovery on the phone, well, there, I have no evidence that the Constitution and the codes are, are applicable to you. 
I tried to bring this up in court uh, during the, at, uh, at the hearing that uh, there is no jurisdiction because you have, you have no evidence that the codes are applicable to me. And um, because the judge assumed jurisdiction without having jurisdiction, it's now on appeal to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. So you can, that's something that everybody here needs to question them because there is no evidence that the codes are applicable to any of us. You know, they'll bring up um, um, the, the, the uh, social contract, and a contract is where somebody does one thing and somebody else does another thing for them. Uh, we have contracted originally to give up some of our rights to get protection of our life and property from the state. 156 years ago, the Supreme Court said the state owes you no uh, protection. protection. So they have canceled the contract. There, there is now no evidence that the Constitution and the codes are applicable. Remember that. I've actually asked that question in court, so I, I support that approach of uh, questioning just the, the fundamentals of the system. And you know, if I sign a contract, I'd really like to see it. So can you provide that? And I'm interested to know, uh, Dan, Dan, is it? Yeah. Uh, what what happens? Uh, there's because I've I've asked that question in court, and of course I've lost as as you did as well at the district court level. Um, but I I don't like to give money to the state, so I've never appealed it. So I'm glad that uh, that you have appealed on this. And when you get a result. If you could email that to news at freekeen.com, that goes out to multiple recipients at Freekeen, and we're going to get that information. I want to publicize that. I want to find out what the Supreme Court says. Oh, yeah, I want it to be publicized. So please, news yes. at freekeen.com, reach out to us uh, on that. I'd like to say, too, uh, I appreciate Dan, you, you know, you're doing it, stepping up to the plate. I mean, you, uh, one of the things I think about direct action, I mean, you don't have to, like, commit your life to this. You can... You don't have to. You just just start somewhere. You know. You don't have to go out and uh, film a police officer. And you know. You don't have to go to the max immediately. Like I, I feel like you should. Uh, like like baby steps. I mean, just start doing whatever you want to do. Hold a sign, and it, you you get better and better and better at things. It's like anything in life. Um, the more you do it, the better you get. And I I don't think anyone should be discouraged. Uh, take a parking ticket to trial. I mean. You just start with anything small, and if, if one of your goals is to uh, be a direct action activist and you know be uh, maybe sitting on this panel or whatever, being uh, kind of living the life, if you will, I mean you got to start somewhere, and, and you can do just so many little things. You could, as one gentleman said, you could just go around and fill the meters, and not tell anyone, or put some cards out, or. I don't think anyone should be discouraged, and everyone, whatever you do, just start somewhere, I guess is my, my little motivating speech here at the end. <laughs> so, you guys have recorded a lot of stuff. You've had cameras knocked around. Uh, you've had cameras taken. Um, what would you recommend for actually carrying and using? Uh, do you guys have a particular brand of camera that you like, or a type of camera? Like, something, if you want something small that you can carry, you can use. What are your recommendations on that? Oh, well, Canon Vixia, right? Am I right? So there are times on the Vixia. Are I've been long. using Canon Vixias oh, as well. Sony Handycam and <coughs> Canon Vixias are the most popular. Can we get that on mic, though, please? Yeah. Sony Handycams and Canon Vixias have been have become the the activism it's standard, I think, yeah. They're cheap enough, and if they get stolen, you don't cry, and the replacement parts, other people have them. They're great uh, tools. I would say, too, I mean, uh, I started off with a flip video camera, just a real cheap one. That That is a cheap way to do it. It, it works pretty well. One of the issues I had was, like, I was holding it, and, the, like, someone knocked it out of my hands onto the ground. And something like this, you can get a little bit better hold. It'll have better. This is a, a Sony Handycam. It's like a $200 camera. You probably can find it on eBay for even less. It shoots HD. The audio is great. As Garrett was pointing out, the the startup time is phenomenal. Like you open the the screen and you know, okay, it's on. You know, it's ready to go. So I mean, I 
like Garrett and I both use handy cams now. And you know, Garrett has like a few little tools maybe he can show you. He has like a, a little grip there uh, for stabilization. There's some things you can do to further improve um, your tools. You want to comment on that? Sure. Uh, one of the things, I, if I'm out doing robin hooding, I'm probably carrying that contraption called the X-Grip. It's a U-shaped design. That makes things so much more convenient. You can be filming behind yourself by just holding it in front of you and looking at the screen. Or you can be filming like over your shoulder. You can mount it on your shoulder. Um, so that device I'd highly recommend. 20 bucks on Amazon for an X-Grip. You can put it in your belt so you can conveniently carry the camera. Um, about the different types of cameras, I started off with a Vixia uh, from Canon. They run about 300 bucks on the lower end. Um, they're great, very high quality image, very high quality mic, um, not that great in low light. The cheaper Sony Handycam that James was mentioning, very good in low light. If you're going to be shooting at night, if you're doing uh, police accountability stuff in low light, that's what you want is the Sony Handycam or other uh, cameras that have good low light quality. And the startup, startup time is really important because if you're in a situation where you need to film, um, you probably should have already been filming by the time you realize that you should be filming. So the less seconds it takes to hit record is, is very vital. And for that reason, uh, I carry the Sony with me if I'm generally out. Also over there, you'll see a, a Nikon Coolpix. It's a $300 DSLR camera. It also takes a very high quality image. Microphones, all right. Um, not that great in low light. So yeah, this, what's the name of the low light thing on the Sony's? Um, I guess so. It, it's called the Exmor sensor. It's kind of like a, a sensor that it kind of plays with the camera settings a little bit. Like I think it lowers the FPS a bit, so more light comes in each frame. You know, it has other uh, <coughs> software. Whatever the chip does, it, it just makes everything look a little bit brighter, if you will. One thing I'd like to say too. Um, one thing you can do, like uh, if you're on public, you can always be audio recording, and then like okay, so I'm 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 audio I'm audioing right, and then uh, that could that could be the like if someone comes up to you and says something or whatever is hostile, you're, you're starting with the camera. Okay, you have a record of it. That's what Ridley does. I highly recommend it. Another tool that's a good thing to have is just like a two-way radio. Uh, I think Ian, do you have any more for sale? Oh, six of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're out, especially with the group, like like I love I love cell phones. They're great, but if we're kind of dispersed over an area. Let's say all of us are out doing something. We're covering an event or whatever. Um, with the radio, it's instant communications, and it's to everyone. A cell phone, I have to like dial or I'd be trying to like text one person. It's just not necessarily the right tool for the job. So I highly recommend the radio. It's something that you're, you know, interested in. Also, another point, depending on the activity, the more. If you can have a partner, or the more people, the better. You'll be more effective. I mean, let's face it, five people holding signs looks better than one. I mean, at the end of the day, people, they will, if you're just a one guy holding the sign, which was like me in Georgia, let's say, uh, the one guy holding the Ron Paul sign, you know, it's just like people are going to marginalize you, so. Well, there's two minutes to the next panel. Yeah, I know. We're about to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody uh, for coming here and staying extra. Thank you to our wonderful panel who's taking time out this morning. And got up, everyone got up early. Thanks for coming out. And, uh, and if you have further questions, just stop us. I mean, we're all going to be here all day long, and, uh, and feel free to ask more if you've got them. Thanks. Hey, thank Ian, you. Could you guys all get together sure. and get a picture of all of you? <coughs> should we stand or? Or maybe Ian should get one. Yeah. If he gets yeah. One. Oh. Um, we'll see. They right, gotta like go. be doing the puppet mess. <laughs> <laughs> right, ready? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.